my private thoughts are often about science or God. I was trained in brain science, and I never stop wondering about God. But when I bring the two together, trying to integrate science and God, I must think carefully. The two are so different, and I fear that my hope may distort my reason. Science can deal with God in three ways. Showing how God is not needed, showing how God is likely, not relating to God at all. Only one way can be best. Science and God, each in its own way, have formed my life. I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey. I start with science and the scientific way of thinking, my roots. I speak with physicist Lawrence Krauss, a leader in the public understanding of science, who probes the meaning and the limitations of science. Lawrence, why is it that most good scientists don't believe in God? I think you're overstating it a little bit. I think that most scientists don't think enough about God to know whether they believe in him or not. It's just irrelevant. There's no evidence that we need anything other than the laws of physics and, and the other laws of science to explain everything we see. Physics has been so successful in describing the universe that we are tend to be the most obnoxious among the scientists in terms of, in terms of our chutzpah, in terms of assuming what we can do. In fact, often overstating the case that science is all there is. Why do you say you know, overstating the case? Well, because, because I've come to realize over the last years that it's really important to realize that science isn't all there is. We now can address with a straight face questions like why is there matter in the universe and what happened in the first billionth of a billionth of a second. And so because of that grand sense of power, I think people tend to say, well, if we can understand things all the way back to the first billionth of a billionth of a second, we understand everything. But science is not the only way of knowing. Many people feel uh, some spiritual sense, and science doesn't address that. Some scientists would say, because science doesn't address it, it doesn't exist. It's nonsense, you're, you're fooling yourself. And that might be right. But if you can't test it, it isn't science. And, uh, and there are lots of things you can't test. I think it is really important to recognize, uh, as has been said, that science does not make it impossible to believe in God. It just makes it possible to not believe in God. <laughs> and, and that's really important, because until you had science, everything was a miracle. So science takes a tremendous amount away from being miraculous and says there's just a pedestrian cause, maybe a wonderful cause, but it's a, it's a, a natural cause. I was at the Vatican once and, and at the Pontifical Academy and lecturing to some theologians, and I said to them, and I wasn't being facetious, that they had to listen to me, but I didn't have to listen to them. Because <laughs> in some sense, I think to, to have a, an honest and sensible theology, you have to be consistent have with to the laws of physics. Right. But I don't need to know anything about purpose or, or, or ultimate purpose of the universe to understand how it works. But is there an area beyond which science cannot go and even in principle cannot go? Yes, of course, I, there is. And, 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 and you, I would say faith in some sense. Faith being defined as that which, which you believe in with the absence of evidence. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm always hesitant to make absolute statements because as we understand more and more about the history of the universe and understand whether our universe is unique, etc., we may come to grips with questions that have traditionally been theological ones. So I can't say that at some point we won't. But it is important to realize at this point what the limits are. And uh, I think there's been a lot of interest in the interface between science and religion, and I find that unusual. I, 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 because I don't think there is much at the interface. Not much at the interface of science and religion, Lawrence? Each works its own world and has nothing to say to the other? But the relationship is not symmetrical. Theology cannot ignore science, but science can and should 
ignore theology. Maybe it's all a polite conspiracy. Atheistic scientists patting God on his non-existent head and quarantining believers in their ancient fantasies. Maybe it's for good reason. I need a scientist who is a believer. Count Francis Collins in the minority, a leading biologist who believes in God. What's more, he's not embarrassed to proclaim his belief. Me? I've felt embarrassed at times, so I admire Francis's courage. Now what about his ideas? We meet at the National Institutes of Health. Francis, as a famous research biologist, head of the Human Genome Project, and a believer in God, do you find that dichotomy difficult? I not only don't find it difficult, I find it incredibly harmonious. And for me, being somebody who has both a scientific worldview and a spiritual worldview, makes me feel like a more whole person than I could be if I was narrowly focused on one or the other. Science is the way to investigate the natural world. I am a scientist. I believe in those tools to find the truth about how the natural world works. But I also believe in spiritual tools uh, to find answers to questions that science can't help me with, like why am I here and is there a God? Doesn't evolution say that everything is totally random and therefore pointless? Pointless, no. Random, maybe from our perspective, because we're trapped in this linear arrow of time. But if God designed the process of evolution to create human beings in his image with whom he could have fellowship, who are we to say that that's not a clever and incredibly elegant method? Well, doesn't it um, indicate a kind of a wasteful use of, uh, of time and uh, energy? Well, let's first say that while we humans are special creatures, and as a believer, I think we have a special relationship with God, the wonderful diversity of all of the other animals and plants and microbes on the planet is a source of great elegance and amazement and helps the whole thing actually work. So you had to also create all of that diversity by some means, I suppose by multiple acts of special creation, gazillions of them, you could have achieved the same goal, but it might not have been nearly as beautiful a tapestry of relatedness as we now see about us and which evolution has managed to accomplish with God, in my view, guiding the whole process. As a believer who sees God's hand in the whole thing, it is possible to look at the scientific evidence in a somewhat different way. It is also a glimpse into the magnificence of God's mind, into his phenomenal uh, ability to use mathematics and physics and chemistry and biology and cosmology and all these sciences to achieve a particularly elegant outcome. And in that regard, science can be also an occasion of seeking something about God's mind, even if uh, you'll accept the word, even an occasion of worship, where by discovering these things about the natural world, we are appreciating in a so small little way, a little bit more about God's grandeur. Francis is so fervent, the excitement of science, the majesty of God. I admire that, but do I believe that? I want to, I must go further. Robert John Russell is founder of the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences in Berkeley. A leader in researching science and religion, Bob is an ordained minister with a doctorate in physics. We meet at my home in Pasadena. Bob, the traditional feeling among most scientists and theologians is that really the data that each one has is of little or no use to the other. How do you see it? Well, theology has always taken the data from its sacred texts, <clears throat> its tradition, and from reason, and culture, and the learnings of culture. So science is part of that, and science therefore has to be part of the data, or what's taken seriously by theology. So if we discover the universe has a beginning, t equals zero, that's important for thinking about God as creator. Maybe that's just some kind of indication of God as creator. So therefore the data of physics 
must be considered by theology. Now, wh what does that mean? Uh, Charles Hartzer, in a process theologian, really believes God experiences the world in the present, the whole world in the present. But if, according to special relativity, there is no global present, the idea of the present makes no sense, it's anthropomorphic illusion, <laughs> then this is a challenge for Hartzorn and for all of us who think of God acting in the world. And Hartzorn, to his credit, said that. He said that one of the biggest challenges to theology in his day uh, it was the, problem, the theory of special relativity. So that is an indication of taking science seriously, even to the point of letting it potentially falsify your view of God. Because God exactly. couldn't exactly. think in the way that the pre-special relativity God could think. Yeah, exactly. But that's, that, that looks like a kind of negative thing. Let's, let's take a positive thing. Let's take Big Bang cosmology. It really does seem to confirm the notion that the universe need not be at all. In fact, there was a kind of time when it wasn't. I call Big Bang a character witness for God. The, the universe looks as if it were created. Hmm. It's not an eyewitness but a character witness. <laughs> it's a good distinction. We had the discoveries of science we need to take on board. Evolution, quantum mechanics, anthrop the scientific anthrop anthropology, Big Bang cosmology. Then we have the methodological parallels, that there are similar ways of reasoning. We can't test theological theories that we, we can, scientific ones. Well, it, there are differences, but not, they're more subtle. You, you are accountable in a testing way to texts that exist. Right? You have to be interpreted by them, and your, your, theolo your the theological doctrines have to be accountable to them. But there's also a lack of testing in parts of science that are mainline science. Cosmology is a historical science. You can't test with a second universe or something. Correct. What right. I want to go to is the, is the fact that you can also move from theology into science. It's more a question of are there ways in which when scientists do science, they actually are thinking to themselves about the universe in a certain way which transcends the findings of science. It's metaphysical, aesthetic, religious, philosophical. So, for example, Fred Hoyle, who was a, you know, a very outspoken atheist, was so angry with Big Bang cosmology because it seemed to be proving God that he constructed a different cosmology, City State, which yeah. for two decades was a su tremendous success. Now, I think that's great. I, he's my hero because he was able to say, I'm a, I'm a committed atheist and therefore I, Big Bang can't be right. So here's an example of a kind of theological reasoning playing a role in guiding him to construct, first, a different theory of gravity from general relativity, and then second, a different model in which there was no beginning. But you don't see a complementarity between science and religion in that both flow, the, the flows in each direction are, are, are the same or no. the same import. No. As a Christian theologian, I have to take special relativity seriously. As a scientist, I don't need to take the New Testament seriously. To Bob, the science-theology nexus is both subtle and profound. Theology must listen to science, that's for sure. But science may embed a theological or philosophical bias, even if subconscious. I love this thinking. But what I love, and what's real, are not neatly the same. For decades, I've admired Ian Barber, who in the 1960s developed science and religion as a field of modern inquiry. I still feel the excitement of opening his path-breaking book. When I hear Ian is in Los Angeles, I jump at the chance to meet him. Ian, let's talk about methodology and compare and contrast science and religion. Well, I think they're different enter enterprises, and you've got to start by saying they're not the same. Uh, there's a kind of testability uh, about scientific theories, never certainty, but uh, and always revisability, but a, a degree of confidence uh, that you can't get about uh, religious ideas. You can see some similarities. Uh, I think uh, the role of uh, imaginative models in both areas, when you're dealing with something you can't observe directly, maybe it's an electron in science, uh, God in uh, religion, but I think there's a much greater kind of testability in the uh, case of, of physics, let's say, uh, never complete, but you can achieve a degree of testing that you simply can't in religion. This is a very important point. Science 
every scientist knows that every theory, every experimental result is subject to further refinement or, or, or ref refutation. Whereas in religion, there is a tendency among most believers to s firmly believe that if they believe, that's it. Well, I think one, one has to realize that science, of course, is always subject to re revision. But so is theology, and, and I think uh, there's much more change in the course of history uh, than people realize. And I think uh, one has to be open to revising perhaps uh, even classical doctrines to some extent. And you're right that the religious community resists this, but I think a certain humility that becomes both the, the scientist and the theologian in making claims about reality that may be beyond what they're capable of supporting. I trust Ian to give a balanced, cogent account of science and religion, neither seeking favors nor fearing consequences. He recognizes that the conclusions of science are more reliable than those of religion. Yet he calls for humility in both, in that each makes extravagant claims about reality. Nice, but many scientists would reject the epistemological equivalence. Oddly, I find myself agreeing with critics. Here's why. Scientists generally know when their claims are extravagant. Theologians generally do not. I need fresh perspective. Good, well, I've enjoyed it. Freeman too. Dyson is one of the great thinkers of our time. A renowned <laughs> physicist and futurist, he won the Templeton Prize for progress about spiritual realities. We meet at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Freeman, what is it about science and theology that causes such passion? I think the reason it causes passion is just because both sides are arrogant. <laughs> both sides have too high opinion of themselves. <laughs> but both sides seem to me misguided and, and counterproductive. And it's unfortunate because, in fact, they represent only a minority on both sides. The vast majority of religious believers are not against evolution, and the vast majority of scientists are not against God. If you look at the real world, it's full of mysteries. That's what makes it exciting, that uh, it's, it's mysteries of all kinds. And every time you solve a puzzle in science, you find two more puzzles waiting to be solved. So science doesn't come to an end. You don't exhaust the truth. And I believe the same is true of religion, that it is every time you talk to any genuinely religious person, you find that, that, that it, it is about mysteries and not, not, not about facts. From the scientific point of view, it is clear where progress is made. But on the theology side, what do you think uh, is our best understanding today? The theology essentially is about images of reality. It, it, it is an art form which is mostly allied to literature. So the great theologians have mostly been those who could write well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and so I find it's like literature. I mean, literature is always bringing us new insights. It's not progress in the, in the sense that you learn that this is right and the other thing yeah. is wrong, but you have new points of view constantly arising. And whether they are truer than anything <laughs> that's written before, of course, is, is, is a meaningless question. <laughs> theology really isn't about truth in the sense of, of, of yes or no. No, my theology, in a way, is sort of, it's based on the idea of maximum diversity as being the sort of the, the, the value which I see in the universe, that if you look at the things which are most precious, for, for example, life and human feelings and things of this kind, that they're enormously diverse, that, mm -hmm. that, that life goes and brought a new degree of diversity into the universe. But the universe, even without life, is growing progressively more diverse as time goes on. I mean, it started out as a uniform cloud of gas and it condensed into galaxies and it condensed into stars and planets and dust clouds and uh, all the rest of it. 
And at every stage of the progress, you had a differentiation of structures, things becoming more and more diverse. So I think that's what God must have had in mind when he <laughs> said, if he has a purpose at all, that it is to create diversity. As, as Darwin said, the good Lord must have had an inordinate fondness for beetles. <laughs> he created so many kinds of beetles. <laughs> Freeman sees purpose in the universe, in human life, and that purpose is diversity. As for the mystery of existence, he embraces it. I go for all that. Further, if there is a God, then diversity out of simplicity must mark God's creation. But ours is a Judeo-Christian worldview. What about other cultures? Michio Kaku, a physicist and visionary, brings together different cultures, Buddhism and Christianity, as well as science and religion. Is Michio enlightened or conflicted? I find out when we meet in New York. Your parents were Buddhists. You were brought up uh, through Christian schools and you obviously became a, a physicist. How do you reflect on this fascination we all seem to find with the science theology nexus? Well, I've always had two parts of my brain that were in constant warfare with each other. Uh, in Buddhism, we believe in this timeless nirvana where there was no beginning, no end. And yet, when I went to Sunday school, I read Genesis, and I read about the fact that there was a beginning to the universe. And then there was also a doomsday, an end to it all, which seemed to violate the, the Buddhist precepts of nirvana. I'm a physicist today, and today we have a multiverse idea where we can meld these two ideas together. The fact that there is a nirvana, which is the nirvana of the multiverse higher dimensions where bubble universes pop into existence, and there was a Big Bang. In fact, many Big Bangs, many Genesis taking place all the time as bubbles pop into existence and pop out of existence. Ever since ancient peoples looked up in the heavens and saw the stars, they wondered, where do I fit in this larger cosmic scheme of things? What does it all mean? <laughs> well, how do we progress forward? Is this just metaphor? Or is there some real serious um, uh, ideas that we, we, we can learn? I think we have to take some of the parables of the past seriously because ancient peoples did come up with rational explanations, at least in their mind, to why there are things. Now, science, of course, says that we have something called reductionism. We split atoms apart, we look smaller and smaller and tinier and tinier objects, and that's the reason why we have the internet today and radios and television, microwaves and flat screens, TVs, because of reductionism. However, reductionism ultimately comes to a halt. We busted atoms apart and found lots of particles that had no rhyme or reason. Well, now we have a more holistic point of view, string theory, which says that we have to look at the entire universe, a universe of strings, a universe which explains why we have so many particles as musical notes on a vibrating string. I think one of the most common denominators of most religions is the idea of harmony, synthesis, harmony, and when you look at science, science also obeys the, some of the fundamental uh, philosophical directions that are found in ancient societies. The search for harmony, the search for unification. And that's why Einstein said that he believed in the God of Spinoza, the God of harmony. That the universe didn't have to be as harmonious as it is, but he did not necessarily believe in the personal God, the God of prayer. He thought there was a lawgiver that is, the laws of harmony. Exploring science and God means probing motivation and methodology. As for motivation, it's natural to use science to reinforce prior belief. If I think God exists, Science shows the glory of God's handiwork. If I think God does not exist, 
Science shows how well the world works without God or anything like God. As for methodology, the scientific method, based on experiment, discovers facts about the physical world confirmable by all. The religious method, based on faith, may offer personal validation of spiritual realms but cannot provide public verification of anything non-physical. Is this progress? Not much. Even so, just considering science and God takes us closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com. <laughs>